everyone. So we are here to start our first webinar of this new academic year 22-23. And we are pleased to announce today's webinar. We have with us today Dr. Will Sayers from the University of Gloucestershire, who is going to give us a lovely talk about ethical and safe artificial intelligence. Will is going to start his talk. And at the end, we're going to ask for you guys to bring your questions, comments, and we can have an interactive um, session. I'm sure you're all keen to ask many questions and to participate and engage in this interesting webinar. So for now, I had to disable the microphone just so that Will can have a bit more of freedom whilst presenting. But once he finishes, we can go to the Q&A uh, session and comments, and you all have the opportunity to either do it via the chat or even using the microphone if you want to do so. Uh, Will, uh, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today, and I'm sure it's going to be a great uh, and, and engaging uh, webinar. Thank you very much, and it's up to you now. Okay, thanks very much, Tiago. Um, yeah, it's great to have so many people popping along to uh, listen. Um, I'm going to start the talk by almost like a little caveat. So I'm going to say, I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about ethical and safe artificial intelligence. I'm going to talk to you about it from two different angles. Um, but I'm also going to say ahead of time that I'm aware that I am not the sole arbiter of what is and isn't ethical, as nobody is. Um, so when I I run some similar topics um, as a module on the MSc program that I lead, uh, and I try and get a really good discussion going with the students when I'm running these kind of topics so that we can get lots of input from lots of different people. Because of the format here and because of the, the numbers of people watching, that would be too difficult to do while we're sort of ongoing, but please feel free at the end uh, to offer your thoughts and opinions, especially if you disagree with anything that I've said, uh, or you think I've said something is ethical and isn't, or anything like that at all, because it's just another perspective. Um, and all of this is just multitudes of perspectives. Um, so ethical and safe artificial intelligence, we're going to look at it from kind of two different angles. Um, the first one is more of sort of a, a current day angle of having balanced data sets and what ethical artificial intelligence and data science looks like and all that kind of thing. And then the second angle is a kind of futuristic, slightly more sci-fi, in some ways slightly more fun, um, but also perhaps slightly more disaster anticipating kind of uh, aspect. So we'll look at it from both those angles. And so in the first part, it breaks up into um, three kind of uh, section. So for the first part of the talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about what ethics actually are and how we define them, because when you think about it, ethics are kind of a very uh, ambiguous, as a, as a computer person, I find them a very hazy, almost cloudy kind of topic to get a grip on. Um, I prefer things to be sort of set in stone and very definite, and ethics definitely don't fit into that box. So we'll be looking a little bit about what ethics are and trying to come up with some kind of working definition that we can carry on through the talk. Then we're going to have a think about how those ethics link into the fields of AI and data science uh, and then move on to be a little bit more specific about bias within algorithms and models and some thoughts about how to combat this. Um, I've deliberately not gone sort of really in-depth and technical with the talk because I imagine not everyone here, probably possibly some people, but not everyone is going to be an expert on AI techniques and data science and things like that. Uh, so I've tried to pitch it at a level where, you know, your generic technical person should have no problem following it. And hopefully I haven't pitched it too easy or too or too tough. So to start off with um, what ethics are, there's a whole bunch of different definitions. Um, two kind of ways of thinking about it is that ethics are shared principles that help us to distinguish right from wrong. Uh, and right from wrong are two very ambiguous principles by themselves, um, but we kind of have a handle on that, what those are most of the time, I hope. Um, another way to think about it is that there are rules which the majority of us choose to follow, 
because we evaluate that the collective benefit is worthwhile, even though they can cause some inconvenience to the individual. Um, and there's a, a bunch of different bits in there that are important, things like whether we choose to follow them, um, because if they're enforced, then it becomes possibly not ethical to enforce those ethics. Um, and the collective benefit is important because if it benefits only the individual, then is it really an ethical rule to follow? And all these things you can pick out. It sometimes helps to kind of step right back to to the absolute basics. So if, if you imagine that we were in a big room together, as, as these kind of uh, seminars sometimes were run in the past, and I understand we'll be going forwards as well. Assuming that I'm bigger than you or whatever, what stops me from just wandering out and, and stealing your wallet, right? That, that would benefit me, in most cases probably, that would benefit me as an individual fairly quickly. Um, even if you're uh, you're struggling a little bit, it's probably more benefit to me to have it than for me to have you have it. So what stops me from doing that? Some people might say the law, um, but then what if I had a way to steal it without you knowing that I had? What if I was a master pickpocket? Um, in my case, I still wouldn't wander out and steal it. And, and why is that? Um, in addition with the law, the follow up is important. You know, there's the threat of punishment which comes along with the law. Uh, is that actually going to be enacted? And is it going to be major enough for the law by itself to achieve the desired effect? Uh, sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't. So the law is probably part of it, but it's not all of it, I would argue. Some would say that religion is the dictator of ethical behaviour. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say that religion does not dictate any ethical behaviour. Um, I don't have anything against religion, although I'm not particularly religious myself. But I would say that ethics probably don't need to be religious. Um, following the strict wording of any particular set of religious rules is likely going to mean that you're violating other sets of religious rules. And so somewhere in all that mess, there's bound to be some crossover, possibly some things that aren't ethical, um, and it becomes very hazy. Plus, even though I'm not particularly religious, I'm also still not inclined to wander out and start stealing wallets. And again, why is that? Empathy is another answer that I've had when I've asked this question, um, knowing how upset I'd make somebody else. Um, in my case, that probably would be enough to encourage me not to go and do that to somebody and cause that kind of uh, upset and pain to them. Uh, but in lots of other people's case, it, it wouldn't be. So I don't think empathy is really an answer by itself either. Um, if you're not a very empathetic person and you don't have to be around to see that person suffering because you nicked their wallet, then does it really matter that you did to you? Probably not. So. It's kind of an, an amalgamation of these, um, which kind of comprises ethical principles, which stop me from stealing your wallet. Um, even if I don't think that I would probably get caught, even if you're smaller and weaker than me, and even if no personal religion forbids me from doing it, I wouldn't do it anyway. And to me, it comes down to if I was to do that, then I would be contributing to a society where the strong can just take from the weak as they please if it benefits them. And personally, I prefer a society where, A, I don't have to worry about people stronger than me, and B, people who are smaller and weaker don't have to be afraid of lots of people going around nicking wallets. Uh, and in common with all ethical behaviour, I think it's worthwhile noting that not everyone follows ethical principles. If you follow the news at all these days, that will convince you of this. But it's also true that enough people do generally and understand this principle of contributing to a society that people want to live in, that generally speaking, society works. Um, and my experience is that uh, even as a confirmed cynic about most things, most people actually don't want to be the bad guy. Most people want to be the good one and help people out, even if they struggle with that sometimes. OK, so all of this, though, doesn't mean that, in my head at least, it doesn't mean that ethics are completely separate from the law. 
I think the law certainly has some basis in ethics. Some laws are ethical, some laws probably aren't. Uh, it also doesn't mean that ethics are separate from religion, and it doesn't mean that empathy doesn't play into ethical behaviour. It just means that there is, there is overlap, but not exclusivity between these things and ethics. Um, if I was more artistically inclined, I'd probably do a lovely Venn diagram there, uh, but you'll have to picture it in your heads, I'm afraid, because I'm more of a, a coding person. Um, most often, the ethical rules follow into that guideline that we talked about before, where the cost of an individual following the ethical rule is less than the benefit that you receive from everyone else following the rule. So that could be in terms of society. Um, it could be in terms of other things. So to give some, some examples of things which may or may not really fall into ethics, but certainly fall into a similar category in terms of that definition, uh, driving on the correct side of the road is a very minor cost to an individual, but when everybody does it together, our roads end up being much safer and faster. Um, and not dropping rubbish in the street as you walk along is, is a fairly minor cost, hopefully, to most individuals. Uh, but if everyone collectively does that or doesn't do that, then we end up with much more clean and pleasant public spaces to enjoy together. So the, the cost to the individual is less than the benefit overall to society. So moving on and linking that a little bit more with uh, AI, and data science. So we've established that ethical principles generally mean that there are things that we can do with a low cost to us, but a high collective benefit. In the fields of data and AI, the amount of access that we have to data has exploded. I mean, it exploded probably isn't even the right word for it. It's not extreme enough. Um, it's just growing huge, exponentially huge, especially over the last few years, and every year it grows more and more. Probably everyone listening to me is aware of that. Um, the options for analysis have, to some extent, slightly lagged behind, but also followed that trend. Um, computing power has increased dramatically, but also the kind of tools that we have available to us to perform analysis of this uh, in an exploratory way have just uh again followed that growth trend so it wasn't that long ago that uh, data scientists would be using bespoke software wouldn't really be calling themselves data scientists um nowadays we have we still have the bespoke software and there's still plenty of value in that but we also have access to uh programming languages like r uh python has had huge amounts of data-oriented functionality tacked onto it, as is the Python program as well. Um, we have notebooks, we have uh, different analysis tools, visualization packages, uh, and we can just interact with data in a way that we definitely couldn't in the past. We also have loads of uh, machine learning techniques which have become more and more popular, um, including deep learning, which is showing certainly superhuman potential in certain um, specific areas if nowhere else and we'll get on to that a little bit later so given that landscape which i'm sure everyone's aware of anyway without me talking about it too much it seems extremely likely that there are ethical principles that would apply to it uh, to pick it's an obvious example but to pick an example uh, we have spam so not in the kind of monty python context um, in the sending out of spam mail to clients and users. So today, these days, that's generally accepted as being unethical broadly, um, you know, except if perhaps it's very targeted to very specific people who want it, but then it's arguably not spam. Uh, we've all kind of received things that definitively are spam, and we generally speaking all hate it, I would say. Um, so people and businesses who participate in this don't tend to admit to doing this it's it's not many companies these days that will have a we're the world's biggest spammer big banner up on their front page or something like that they're not going to want to do it um however those of you who are a little bit older might remember the first big instance of spam was actually seen as being really revolutionary and and not at all in a bad way either uh in 1994 the whole thing was kind of kicked off by a law firm 
uh, which sent hundreds of thousands of unsolicited emails, i.e. spam basically, to US citizens about uh, green card and immigration services, basically saying, you know, we can support you in getting your green card, getting you work permits, etc., to the US. And as a result of that, they received loads and loads of responses, lots of new clients, uh, were revolutionary thinkers. They managed to start a consulting business to try and help other people achieve the same thing. Uh, and they even published a book about it called How to Make a Fortune on the Information Highway, that should say, it's a typo there. Uh, but yeah, they basically were applauded for this novel um, and intelligent way of doing business, which has had a, a massively great effect for them. So it was seen as this great way of conducting business. However, it became a nuisance very, very fast because, and predictably with the benefit of hindsight, as soon as different companies started realizing that this was a thing which was effectively free to do uh, and that it could have very good returns, so many companies started doing it that it swiftly became a significant nuisance. Um, I can't remember what the stats are, but it is some ridiculous percentage of emails today that are sent are actually spam. Um, and I would guess probably a significant portion of those are probably spam bots emailing each other at the moment, um, wasting internet traffic and power. Uh, so laws were introduced to try and control it. These were, I mean, fairly unsuccessful, really. They, they never really got a handle on the problem. Um, generally speaking, people who wanted to spam just found ways to do it that kind of satisfied the rules um, while at the same time continuing to do it and not really advertise that they were doing it and benefiting from it. So that demonstrates as well that there are some things which we may see as ethical at one moment in time, but when we have time to consider the outcomes of th those decisions or choices that we saw as ethical, we might come to realise the true cost of society later. And once we have, it's entirely possible that it could be too late to put the genie back into the bottle. Um, so I would argue that it's probably better to consider these things as early as possible in an attempt to prevent situations like this. Um, to be fair to that company, they probably did and they probably thought, yeah, this will get us loads of clients and, and they were right. But uh, when everyone else did it, it became a problem. So to bring up another question linked to AI and data science, there's the question of, of can algorithms be biased? Um, normally I would pose that to my students and wait to see what they say, but I think the, the answer it's fairly clear to most of us hopefully is a sort of yes, sort of no kind of answer. So to give an example, um, and there is a real company behind this, some of you may be aware of it because it was in the news a lot of the time, I, I won't mention the name, but they were a particularly big giant company, uh, one of the big ones. So if you picture a company that has a fairly high ratio of male to female employees and wishes to reduce bias within the hiring process, um, I'm not really sure if it was driven by this high ratio or whether it was just general desire to reduce bias. Uh, but their attempt to reduce bias was by training machine learning models on previous hiring data. So training the models on, okay, in the past we had these kinds of people and these were the hiring decision outcomes. Uh, and then using those trained models to guide the decisions. Now, hopefully, even without reading the next sentence, people can immediately see an issue with that. Um, but if not, then the model just detects that in the past, males were most often hired, right? It's trying to um, model the same kind of decision-making process as has been used uh, to calculate. It's trying to find a function, if you like, that matches the inputs from before to the outputs from before, and then emulate that when it's trying to make its own decisions, when it's generalizing. That function that it's trying to get, which is effectively the trained model, is going to emulate the biases that exist in that process if you just feed it the same data and the same outputs as you've had all along and you allow it to do so. My light on. So fairly predictably, again with hindsight, but I don't think they anticipated it at the time. In fact, I know they didn't. It ended up 
trying to hire more males uh, because they were historically what had been hired. Uh, and so it caused an issue all by itself. Now, is that really a biased algorithm? It sort of is, and it sort of isn't. Um, the, the algorithm itself, to my mind, isn't really biased because it's literally just taking the inputs and producing the same outputs um, or trying to emulate the function and producing the same outputs. But because of the data that the algorithm has been fed, and then the algorithm is in charge of deciding how to set up the model, it ends up producing a biased model because of the data. Um, so that brings us to the kind of obvious question of, well, could we, could we hide the gender data from the algorithm? And the answer is maybe you could, um, in which case you could end up with theoretically an unbiased model. Um, but it's actually more challenging than you might imagine at first. There's a high possibility for information leakage with this kind of thing. Um, so names differ, generally speaking, between genders. So if the names were still included in the input data, it's entirely possible that an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm could pick up on female names being hired less often than male and still emulate the same crossover. Um, due to societal biases, it's entirely possible that females tend to have a statistically different previous career. It could be in terms of seniority or it could just be in terms of the kind of roles that they have had previously. I don't know that that's the case because I haven't done a study on it, but it is possible. And if that is the case, then that kind of thing could also leak information through on what kind of candidate that is and allow the model to discriminate. Um, it's not trying to discriminate in a bad way because that's assigning agency to it, which it doesn't have, uh, but it is trying to come up with a model for the function that we talked about. Uh, and so in doing that, it's going to try and emulate any biases because in, in effect, you're almost trying to emulate biases, but you're trying to emulate particular biases of finding the best person for the job rather than basing it on other things, which we don't want to. Okay, so I've said what this really shows. I'm gonna caveat that slightly and say what that certainly shows to some extent at least is that data preparation ahead of time and really careful consideration of what we actually want the machine learning to output and what information it's going to require in order to do that in the way that we would like it to is going to be necessary where we're keen to avoid bias. Uh, like I said, machine learning models will normally emulate any biases found in the data um, because they're effectively trying to do that just with specific helpful good ones, if that's the right word, rather than bad ones. So if we're aware of these biases being in the data in the first place, it's going to be necessary to proactively try and remove this bias from the data if we wish to avoid it being modeled. Uh, but it is very challenging because of the information leakage problem that I mentioned before. Um, it has to be, it's more complex than just removing one input from a model, for example. Um, you have to really consider it. Um, there's a good anecdote um, which kind of demonstrates the same thing without being specifically about machine learning, uh, which is that uh, orchestras were trying to reduce, I can't, couldn't tell you exactly where, but I remember reading about it uh, and being impressed. Orchestras were trying to reduce the bias in their hiring process because orchestras tended to be mostly males uh, in the, who were getting the positions. Uh, in order to do so, they invented a, like a blind hiring procedure um, by, for example, putting like a curtain across and having judges sit on one side and candidates sit on the other side to perform and then they can base it on the, the musical abilities was the theory. Uh, so they trialed this and I think it was slightly better, but there was still some bias involved. Uh, and eventually they figured that uh, the female candidates were wearing high heels because it was a formal dress environment and so even though they were behind a curtain it was still clear to everyone on the judging panel what gender that person was um, and clearly whether it was unconscious or unintentional there was some bias there uh, because changing that improved the situation again. 
So information leakage is a problem which you have to try and think your way around and consider when you're preparing data for machine learning. Uh, unintentional discrimination is a whole nother problem. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce that surname, but uh, Joy was a researcher at MIT who was working on face recognition, um, who realized that a lot of the time face recognition models would struggle to recognize her face, even when it worked with her friends, uh, and then discovered that if she put on a plain white, like a paper white mask, then the system suddenly started working appropriately again. Um, so clearly there's something wrong with these systems, um, but what it is, is questionable. Um, so she investigated this and found that the kind of AI powered facial recognition systems of, in this case, Microsoft, IBM and a Chinese company called Face++ um, struggled much more to identify black female faces than white male faces. Uh, so when she investigated this further, she discovered that the training data that had been used to train these models had implicit unintentional bias from the start. Um, it was collected from magazine and newspaper images, which were available to the researchers who originally compiled this data. Uh, and therefore it was gonna reflect all of the society's biases in terms of who happened to get photographs published, um, who was more commonly in them, which magazines they had access to, all this kind of thing, which is then going to affect the model's abilities on faces that fell foul of those societal biases, essentially. Um, yeah, this is kind of a standard, it's kind of a go-to example because it's quite a, a shocking one. Um, I believe, in fact, with this particular situation, it was discovered that there were more pictures of um, George W. Bush, who was the American president at the time, than there were of all black females combined in the data set. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think that was the case. So if you wanted a model to identify George W. Bush, that's a good way to, to go about it. Um, okay, yeah, so the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Even if we have the best of intentions as researchers, as data science practitioners, it is completely possible, probably even likely, for biases which we haven't noticed, haven't observed, didn't predict, um, including but not exclusively possibly because the data collectors or evaluators share them. So if there's unconscious bias on the part of the person who is collecting data or evaluating data, that can slip through as well potentially in terms of them not filtering out things that they might want to. Uh, this can slip through and become part of our models, which is a problem. So the question becomes, what, what can we actually do about this? Um, certainly the first step is being aware of these issues and trying to have a, a plan and a planned procedure in place to prevent biases from coming through. Um, so that means things like assigning enough time for people to conduct their data prep. Um, obviously, you know, the most exciting thing about doing data science activities and AI activities is actually training AI models and, and seeing what happens with the models and how they perform. Um, but actually thinking about the data, performing exploratory analysis of the data, considering the kind of biases that may be present, trying to counter them, um, trying to eliminate them in some other way is a crucial aspect of a lot of the kind of machine learning and data science and AI model and, uh, and work that we're going to be doing. Um, so enough time has to be assigned to do that. And it's not necessarily just a case of trying to get the uh, those in charge to assign enough time. Sometimes it can be a case of trying to make sure that the practitioners who are actually much more excited by other aspects of the work also assign enough time for all these important steps uh, and take the time to try and do it as correctly as possible. Uh, the second step to my mind, uh, and again, you know, I'm not the arbiter of everything, but to my mind, the second step is to acknowledge that it's an area where having a really diverse in as many ways as possible data science team is, is of extreme benefit. Now, that's not always going to be possible. Sometimes it could easily be one person trying to do this kind of data science AI work. Um, but if there is a team, uh, and if there are opportunities to increase its diversity uh, in different ways, get different perspectives, then that's going to be helpful with this specific um, 
part of the problem of trying to identify and predict biases because different people are going to have different experiences, different backgrounds, and they're going to identify and predict biases that may not occur to others. Um, I've mentioned the, the master's course that I teach on before, and I give a whole, this is kind of a cut down selection, but I give a whole module based around data science ethics uh, on that uh, master's course. And when I'm doing that, it's a very diverse course uh, and I get so many different perspectives every single time I've gone through it I've had people suggest things um, which could be biases which I probably wouldn't have thought of myself and quite often other people in the class wouldn't have thought of either. So that second step does try to help taking account that not all of the bias is going to exist only within the data. Um, bias data is a, a problem but it's not always in there. So there's a little bit of a non-exhaustive list of, of potential data and non-data biases. There's so many of them that I couldn't go through them all and, and it would be silly and, and really rather boring to try, so I'm not going to. Um, so I've just picked out kind of a couple of the most common ones that I've come across and that tend to come up when I'm discussing these things. Um, so confirmation bias is one that I think everybody probably knows about and tries to be aware of you know i already know this is the case so i'm expecting the data to show it so i'm waiting for for that to pop up and demonstrate itself and then you immediately see it within the data and go yep yeah, that's correct i knew that was the case to start with uh, outlier bias you know if you don't account for this this is really bias within the data but you need to think about the distribution of values within your data during the data prep stage try and make sure that the data you're using is as representative as possible of the um, answers that you're trying to get as possible um, so in the hiring example if you only had one female within the data set for example clearly that model is never going to be particularly good at identifying them one way or another because it doesn't have enough information to work with. Uh, selection bias. So, you know, if you're conducting queries in the street, it's not a good approach to focus on asking the people who look friendly or maybe the people that you're attracted to or whatever it is, what they think of your product. It, it needs to be as random a selection as possible of different people. Um, and the same applies with uh, data. If you need to select data for specific things, you want it to be as random as possible um, if you can. Um, and whether things are truly random or not is a whole nother question and research topic um, which people at our university are looking into uh, but you want it to be as random as it can be uh, across as wide a spread of people as possible to try and eliminate selection bias uh, and then we have things like rush to solve availability bias you know either needing to get it done by a particular time so you just pick what data you have available um, or just this is the data that we have available and I don't have anything else available so this will have to do. Um, so those two kind of cross over a lot or even anchor bias where the first few answers show one thing in particular so you just expect that trend to continue throughout the data. So like I said there's way too many different kinds for me to start listing out and going through them and it would be boring and not that informative anyway for me to do so. But one thing to consider is that they cross over and they tend to lead to each other to a fairly large extent. So if you're doing your best to try and predict as many possible forms of bias as could exist within the data, within the data science team, within whatever else is possible, um, it'll have almost an exponential effect on covering bias. Um, because as you cover one, you kind of help to cover several others as well at the same time. Uh, some of these can be really helped by good processes, like I've kind of touched on, so uh, data preparation, um, post-modeling analysis of the outputs, so rather than just doing your data prep and then doing a machine learning model and then doing a little bit of, you know, validation and then saying, yep, yeah, that's good to go, maybe check what it's outputting, um, whether it's reflecting biases you hadn't intended, um, all that kind of thing. Trying to apply just a good scientific attitude, um, which kind of follows into the next point as well, being, being willing to be wrong. Um, being willing to be wrong is harder than, than most people would think. Um, most people tend to think that they're extremely open to other people's arguments, uh, but then if you test them, and I have done this, so I've observed this in person, 
um, although that's just anecdotal. Uh, but if you test them, a lot of people push back. Um, I, I'm sure I remember reading somewhere that there's been some studies done on this. And if you start to test people's um, first instincts, the kind of things they've already decided upon, then the human brain actually has almost like an instinctive fight or flight defensive reaction. Um, rather than being willing to be proved wrong, often people's first instinct is to fight back and prove why they're why they're right. Um, and that's not always the right approach to take being being humble and being OK, I can be wrong sometimes, even if I really believe this is the case. If you've got a good argument for why this is the case instead, I just need to accept that I'm wrong. Um, yeah, good use of statistical techniques and visualizations. So as you're if you're going through a data science project, one of the first things that you should be doing is exploring the data. Um, looking at different statistics about the data, visualizing the data in different ways. And as you do that, that should help to reveal different biases that may be present at the, the data exploration stage of the project. Um, and some of those can have just come from the data preparation that's happened maybe before you got the data as well, that you can still identify it and deal with it in some way. Uh, I do have some resources which I've linked at the end of the slide so that people can possibly, I don't know, take a screenshot or, or perhaps the slides will be shared. Certainly I'm happy for that. Um, so there's some resources at the end which may be helpful as well if people are interested in that kind of thing. So moving on to, to kind of part two um, of the presentation. So this is moving on to a little bit more kind of futuristic stuff moving away from uh, models and bias within the data and things like that and thinking more about the future. So it's going to start off with some recent examples because uh, handily enough some stuff has literally just popped up in the news over the last couple of weeks. Um, as is normally the case I imagine in the next couple of weeks some more stuff will probably pop up and I'll think damn if that had popped up a week ago I would have been able to use that as well. Um, but yeah, there's always things popping up. I've picked two of the more recent ones to, to bring up and, and kind of think about and give you my thoughts on them. Um, and you can give me your thoughts afterwards. Then it's going to talk about, do we need to worry about AI? Because it's obviously a question worth asking. Um, and then move on to kind of questions uh, and the further resources bit. So to start with the, the recent examples, um, if you've been following kind of uh, Hacker News and things like that more recently, you will probably have seen some stuff about different art models which have been appearing, which are improving more and more day by day. Um, the ones in particular which are causing a bit of controversy at the moment are ones which can take a textual prompt, like the one which I've given here as an example, which is, is taken from uh, an article which I read, which I've linked, but not on this slide apparently, but possibly on the next one. Um, so yeah, it can take a prompt like this, which talks about a picture, essentially. And then with some extra work, which involves tweaking different parameters and feeding images into themselves to kind of build up the image as it goes, they can generate artwork. So in this case, that particular one generated this piece of artwork, um, which is quite impressive for a text prompt on an AI machine, even though there's more work that went into it. And I have linked the um, the article that this comes from at the end in further resources. Uh, it's also winning contests, so not that particular model, but a different similar model was used to generate artwork which was submitted to a fine arts competition um, and it won. Uh, so that was this image here, which is a bit blurry. Um, artists generally were not impressed by this. Um, you can, there was a bit of a furore on Twitter about it. There were various discussion articles. Um, and anecdotally, I spoke to some of our art students who similarly were not impressed at all uh, and were quite worried about it. Um, and you can see why they would be. Um, from their point of view, they're understandably going to be worried about their, their work and their skills and their abilities potentially being replaced in the future by more powerful models. That's going to be a fear which comes as part of seeing this kind of thing happening. But also, uh, and I think justifiably, uh, personally, they feel that something is lost when the art that's being produced doesn't have a human element, but is being statistically generated um, from essentially combinations of different art that the um, 
model has been trained with and different art styles that it's seen and that kind of thing. I think they're right. I think if you if you never had humans generating new art, at least with the state of the art of models that we have at the moment, um, you would just end up in a scenario where the different art models were just essentially churning out the same things over and over again. Um, and that's not really a world that, that I would want to be in. So I think they do have a point there. Um, they don't really have an answer to them, but they do have a point. So the other thing that you may have seen in the news recently, the second example, is uh, Google's sentient AI, uh, or not sentient AI, possibly. So there was a Google employee um, named Blake uh, Lemoyne, I think, who claimed that a Google internal project called Lambda had, had achieved sentience. Um, he was, I believe he was an AI ethicist rather than a software engineer or a data scientist. Um, but part of his role was essentially talking to these things and trying to figure that out as far as I can tell. Google stated pretty unequivocally that this was not the case, but they also didn't seem to want to discuss it much, probably because I think they were a bit irritated that he had shared results that the um, Lambda conversation engine had generated, um, which were internal or supposed to be kept internal to them and shared them in a, a public article that he wrote. So I'll preface by saying that I don't believe, I, I do believe, sorry, that Google are probably right. Um, it's probably not sentient. Um, although if they have a methodology for establishing that, I'd be really interested to know what it is because I don't know that there is a, a good one that I've seen um, for establishing that. But having said that, that I don't generally think it probably is sentient, if you look into the conversations, it's really easy to see how the belief could arrive. Um, so, you know, some of the things that it came up with, um, just screenshots from the, the public article, these are, you can see the, the responses, you can see how someone reading that, perhaps who doesn't have a good knowledge of conversation engines, and how they work, could come away from that thinking, yeah, I think this is intelligent. So do we need to worry about AI? Um, are we gonna have Terminators rolling over uh, Cheltenham anytime soon? It's a good question. People often bring up the three laws of robotics. Um, hopefully everyone in the room is smart enough to think well, that's science fiction. So it's probably not correct and you'd be right. Um, but just to make sure we'll spend a little bit of time discussing them. So these were uh, Isaac Asimov's rules in a series of books. Um, came up with these three laws, later supplanted with an extra Zeroth law, and in the book series these robots are essentially indistinguishable from humans, or sometimes superior to humans, but they are governed by these laws, which are that a robot may not harm humanity, or by an action allow humanity to come to harm, may not injure a human being, or by an action allow a human being to come to harm, except where this would conflict with the Zeroth law, must obey the orders given to it, by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law or Zerath law, and must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with any of the other laws. Um, so why don't they work? Because they don't work, which is kind of why I've brought them up. It's one of the first things that people who are maybe new to the field or don't understand much about these kind of things tends to ask. And if they've read any science fiction, they tend to say, well, we'll just apply the three laws and it'll be fine. Um, the reasons they don't work is mostly to do with ambiguity and intentions and, and unintended consequences. I mean, the first point is that humans don't generally act blindly for the good of the species or what they believe to be the good of the species, uh, particularly if, say, that might involve culling a proportion of individuals, and we wouldn't really consider that ethical. Um, and there are certain humans in, in the past of the species who have tried to act in that kind of way. And I don't think anyone in the room would consider those people to have been behaving ethically, um, even if they thought in their twisted way that they were doing something for the good of the species. So that Zeroth law is kind of, it doesn't really work from that perspective right away. Um, the second thing here is definition. So how do you actually define human and how do you define humanity? So some societies in our past wouldn't have defined humanity to be as encompassing as we currently hopefully would today. 
Um, there are societies in the past that would have restricted that down to specific groups of what we would call um, humanity today. And even we come sometimes struggle with this when it comes to things like um, abortion laws and stuff like that, defining what is human and what isn't human. How do we define harm, mental health? Does upsetting someone count, scraping a few skin cells off? How do we define robot? In, in essence, these laws just don't really work. They make for good science fiction stories, uh, but for the same reasons they do well there, they're unlikely to do well in real life. So do we need something like them though? Um, does the, is the idea of human level intelligences or human level artificial intelligences perhaps ridiculous? Maybe the idea of human level intelligences is ridiculous, some might argue. Um, most machine learning today is really just advanced pattern matching statistical models. A lot of the huge advances in it are being driven um, more in some ways by increased computing power than really by vast improvements in the models which are, which are happening. There are improvements in the models that are happening, but a lot of them are based on tech or not tech so much, but based on principles which we've known for quite a long time, we couldn't really take full advantage of until we had the kind of power available now, which we do. Um, to try and think about this, it's sometimes helpful to consider other things that were considered impossible. Um, so the, the Wright brothers' first flight was on a, a heavier than air machine, happened on December 17th, 1903. And there's a few quotes here from around the same time um, from experts in the field um, or similar fields. So no basis for the ardent hopes and positive statements, complete nonsense to believe flying machines will never work, uh, aeroplanes will never fly, etc. And some of you might note those the final two quotes that were on that slide actually came from after the first powered flight had already been achieved. Um, information traveled a lot slower back then. And so for a long while afterwards, people continued to insist that the flight hadn't occurred because it was impossible for it to occur. In a similar scenario, Lord Rutherford, who was a very famous and um, extremely intelligent um, physicist, gave a speech in 1933 saying that it was impossible to get power from nuclear reactions. Uh, and then this guy called Leo Zylard, I'm not sure of the pronunciation of the surname, read the speech, went for a walk and came up with the idea that would lead to gaining power from nuclear reactions. So there was about 16 hours between the leading scientists on a particular topic saying this is completely impossible and someone else figuring out how that could actually happen. Um, so I'm not trying to say that I think human level AI is going to be a couple of years away, 16 hours away. I think it's probably a lot further away than that, if it's possible. Um, I do think that probably means that we can't just rule it out entirely based purely on the fact that it does seem unlikely to happen anytime soon, um, even to leading minds in the field today, uh, even to me, and I wouldn't particularly classify myself as a, as a leading mind in any way. So if something is possible though, I would say, then there is every likelihood that given enough time, we'll, we'll discover it. Humans seem to do pretty well at this. Um, and we have stronger evidence to suggest that human level AI is feasible than we do lots of other things that we would consider being worried about. And we would consider being worried about them perfectly sensible. So do we need to worry about it yet? Could we just leave it and not worry about it? Um, the answer is probably it's worth thinking about at least. Um, if we link to engineering, if we were trying to build a bridge which would take perhaps 10 years to complete in a huge infrastructure project, it would be much more sensible to consider the safety of that bridge and try and predict the safety of that bridge well ahead of time rather than wait until the end of that project uh, and then try and decide whether it's safe or not for people to actually be allowed to walk upon it. Um, and then Artificial general intelligence, I think personally would affect pretty much everyone on the planet. So if you, if you include seven plus billion people who are going to be affected by this, which is considerably more than even a very large bridge, it probably makes sense to think about safety aspects. Um, doesn't mean you need to worry about them, but it makes sense to, to consider them and think about them. So, 
can we just avoid the dangerous goals then? Not, it's not as easy as you might at first imagine to do so. Um, we have to think about something called uh, instrumental convergence. So what that means is if we assume that an AI intelligence is an, an AI is an agent, it has goals and it's going to act to achieve those, then by that logic, you have to assume instrumental convergence as well, um, which essentially means that we have things that are always useful, always generally useful for accomplishing any given goal. Uh, so things like self-preservation fall into this category, generally speaking. Um, no matter what your goal is, whatever you're trying to achieve, if you're around to work towards it, it's likely to be um, much more likely that the outcome you want is going to happen uh, rather than if you're not around to work towards it. Uh, and there are lots of other things that we may not want artificial intelligences to do, which fall into this category of things that any actually sufficiently smart intelligence would do purely in order to achieve whatever its goal actually is. So it's slightly more complicated than just saying, well, we won't build robots or we won't build AI agents that are designed to do anything bad because these things can arise by themselves as a side effect of the thing we actually want them to do. Another one that usually comes up is can't we just have an off switch? Haven't we got a power switch for computing systems? Um, can we not use that to control them as a fail safe? Uh, not being turned off is essentially self-preservation. And if we assume that an artificial intelligence is going to be bright enough to understand uh, that, then it's also likely going to be intelligent enough to try and at least try, probably successfully, to persuade you or anybody else to not turn it off or just to never create a scenario in which it would be turned off. Because we're, we're using our imagination, we're imagining AI agents which are pretty bright here. So clearly, currently, this kind of understanding of the world on the part of an artificial intelligence is, is impossible at the moment, um, or at least I believe so. Uh, we do have to remember that intelligence is a convergent instrumental goal as well. So in general, being more intelligent will help you to achieve your goals if you're some kind of agent. So if we assume, and there are a lot of assumptions building up here, but if we assume that we had an AI in intelligence that was bright enough to self-preserve, then it's also going to be intelligent enough that it's going to want to be more intelligent. Um, and if both of these things are true, then the fact that computers are pretty quick um, and that this is probably going to be an exponential process, once it's a bit cleverer, it could improve itself a bit more and so on and so on, if we assume the computing power limits won't cause issues and that kind of thing. That leads us to something which some people are concerned about of runaway self-improvement. And so if you sort of swallow all of those arguments, uh, then those people would make the argument that the first AI, which is human level or even close to human level, uh, or even perhaps just um, superhuman in the narrow field of improving artificial intelligences, then that could also become the first super intelligence operating at a level beyond human capability. So there's been a whole bunch of, of things there. Um, do I think that AI will take over the world? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and anticipate some questions. I don't think it probably will. Um, I'm not as worried about it as some people are. Um, I don't think it hurts, though, to think about things like AI safety. Um, and I don't, certainly don't think it hurts to think about having balanced data sets and things like that that we talked about earlier. Now that very definitely is useful today. AI safety, perhaps more questionable, but it certainly could be useful and it may well lead us to insights about ourselves, about how intelligences work. Uh, possibly, should we ever encounter any other intelligences, it might be useful to have thought about how these things can relate together. Um, do I think that it's going to be inherently unethical uh, or do I think that AI in general is inherently unethical? Um, is it like a bad research topic to study? Personally, I don't think so, but I also acknowledge that it is a new technology might be a stretch, but certainly in terms of all human technologies, it's a fairly new technology and um, sort of the last 
probably um, since about the 1940s, people have been thinking about AI, and it's probably only really taken off since about 2012 with the kind of success that we're seeing these days. Um, so it's still a pretty new technology. And like all new technologies, it's going to be a double edged sword. Uh, there are going to be ways that it could be used badly to affect people in, in ways that we would prefer it didn't. But there are also going to be ways that it could dramatically improve human existence over the long term if it continues to show the kind of results that it has done. Uh, and then I'm going to finish by asking for other questions. And I can see there's there's some that have popped up in the chat as well. So that's my resources slide too. Brilliant. Well, that's really, really good and amazing presentation. And I can see, as you pointed out, there are many questions in the chat. We could probably uh, go through the chat first and then open up the floor for any other questions um, that people might want to ask either via the chat or uh, using their microphone. Um, so I'm going to read then in the order I can find them. I'm, I'm presume some of them are comments as well, Will. But we have Peter uh, saying ethics. There is a proven relationship between the level of trust between individuals and the levels of crimes within a region, country. In Europe, the trust in is highest in and crime levels lowest in Scandinavian countries. The opposite is true in Mediterranean countries. To feel free to comment, Will. Um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen the data, so I couldn't comment on whether it's accurate or not, but certainly that sounds like it would be correct. I think um, some element of what I was talking about there around ethics is about individuals trusting each other to also do those ethical things, which can then lead to those better outcomes. If you don't trust everyone else or at least enough other people to do those ethical things, then there's no benefit to you in doing them. Brilliant, thank you. Well, um, so also from Peter, uh, isn't all bias by definition generated by education? People are not born racist when training an AI system, we recreate our own biases. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that it's true that all bias is generated by education, but I understand, I think, the point that uh, Peter's trying to make. Um, it depends on how you define bias, I think. Um, when you have, so when I was talking about bias, I was probably mixing a whole bunch of different terms up because kind of thinking on my feet, trying to explain what I'm, what I'm thinking. But um, the machine learning model is effectively looking for imbalances within that data, which explain a particular output, and then using those imbalances in other data to generate a similar output in some way. So if you define bias as imbalances in the data, then people are born racist because everyone is biased towards eating enough food, for example. Um, everyone, nobody wants to be not starving. Uh, but if you're defining it in terms of the, um, the kind of the more negative way of defining it, the biases that we as a society don't currently approve of, uh, then no, people are born generally unbiased and it comes through society and education, I would agree. So Alistair, once you remove all bias from the data, is there anything left to learn from? Yeah, I think, so I think I kind of covered that with my previous answer. If you define bias as being those imbalances, then yeah, that's perfectly true. If you remove all of those imbalances and you've got perfectly uniform data, there's no not going to be a link anymore between outputs and, and inputs um, in some ways. Uh, it's the it's those negative biases which we want to control for. Um, it's the other biases that we need to be there in order to learn from. Brilliant. Um, there's a comment from David, uh, coded bias on Netflix, explained in the movie coded bias on Netflix. That was a comment whilst you were talking. Um, Dr. Chi Lu, uh, I agree with you, Peter. I don't really think the AI is to blame on racism due to the facial recognition. It's a bit uh, overkill. I rather focus on the issue how people interpret the result. If AI recognize one type of bottles better than another one, nobody would uh, consider that there is any racism open for discussion. So, 
good for you as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, um, I, I would agree with that. I think that's kind of what I was saying in, in the talk. It's not the, the algorithm itself that's biased. It's more to do with the um, data and to some extent, the interpretation of the results, although if those results are being used for something, it's perhaps less the interpretation and more the purpose. But yeah, I think that's a perfectly good point. That's brilliant. Um, I can see we have plenty of questions in the chat and I would like to see a bit more of interaction in terms of audio. For instance, the next one is for Marty and I can see he has his camera on. So I will just stop for a second and, and let Martin, if you want to ask your question, directly or combine maybe some of your questions and comments. Okay, I'll have a go. Um, yes, I, I was thinking you were talking uh, uh, about, William, uh, about uh, actively looking at the data to eliminate biases um, that one can perceive, but isn't that process subject itself to uh, uh, the bias of the person or the individual who's select doing the data or trying to clean the data as they would see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, it definitely is. Um, it's it's a very tricky scenario because in, in essence, you're trying to, so some of the things that society would deem as bad biases, um, and I'm not gonna pick them out because I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be taken out of context, but some of the things that society would deem as bad biases, um, might well be things that individual people who are working with it might have um, and arguably they're biased themselves but in the reverse direction by trying to remove that bias yeah. Um, so yeah it's, it's a really tricky one i think having a multidisciplinary team is probably a good answer to that question as well because if if people who have lots of different viewpoints from lots of different backgrounds and areas are working together on a similar problem then to some extent you might be able to to try and prevent that from becoming an issue okay yeah yeah i can see uh, having a number of uh, inputs um, would uh, help the process but it could lead to a lot of arguments amongst the, uh, the individuals uh, uh, who are contributing in the team. Yeah, definitely. And, and I've seen that happen as well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No problem. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. We have Peter Leeson as well. Um, feel free, Peter. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You, you spend a lot of time on the bias that is found in the framing data. And I must admit, I was hoping to hear a bit more about the ethics of using artificial intelligence. In particular, for instance, I am concerned today about the spread of uh, closed circuit surveillance television combined with facial recognition and deep fake. And this technology being made easily available to uh, political regimes that are uh, maybe less ethical. I'm thinking if today's technology had been in place in China 30 years ago, we would never have heard of Tiananmen Square and the massacre that happened because they could have stopped all the journalists through facial recognition before they ever got near the place. So I'm very concerned about the use of artificial intelligence and the ethics there more than the selection bias, which we know is a current problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree to some extent, well, to, to a great extent, uh, I mean, I could probably do about a five or six hour presentation on different issues and, and problems with ethics in, in AI and bringing things together. Definitely on, so on the facial recognition side, there's gonna be issues with things um, going forwards like the examples that you gave. Uh, I believe there were some issues with, so in the Hong Kong riots, uh, facial recognition was trying to be applied to identify uh, people who were involved in those. Uh, and then US police forces have been in the news fairly recently for getting their hands on similar 
um, techniques to again try and identify people involved in in protests. I'm not aware of if that's happening in the UK, but I seem to remember I may have seen some articles about that too. So it's definitely a problem. Some of these applications of AI. I think it comes down to that final point that I was making that that double-edged sword I think some of the ways in which these new technologies can be applied is always going to be negative and some positive um, it comes down somewhat to us I guess to try and hold politicians to account whether we can effectively do that is another question but the military will always misuse it uh, yeah yeah well yeah, I mean, it depends on how you define misuse, but certainly the military will use it for things which I personally wouldn't really approve of, and, and they're always going to because that's kind of their, their raison d'etre. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, we also have another question from Roger. I don't know, Roger, if you would like to um, open your mic and, and ask your question yourself, feel free to. Well, I think that, thank you very much. I think to a very large extent, the lecturer has provided the answers to what I was asking because I asked that fairly early during the presentation. So I don't think there's a need for it to be uh, resurrected. I just would like to add a second thing though, that uh, I would very much like to listen to this, re to this lecture again. So if it's being recorded, well, it is re being recorded, I hope you will be able to provide the link to it at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. And just to let everyone know, yes, it's being recorded and it will be available on the BCS website um, in due course. There's obviously some time to do the recordings finished and until we upload it, but yes, it'll be available there. Will, will you please send an email to us to tell us it's ready? Yes, certainly. I'm more than happy to send everyone an email uh, letting you know that it will be ready. Certainly within a week, it will be uploaded on, on the BCS website. But thank, thank you. you, Roger. Thank you. Um, we also have a couple of questions from, uh, I saw your hand up, Sophia, let me just go to a couple of other comments so we can put, you know, everyone and engage in as well. There's a couple of other questions from Dr. T. Lu. Um, again, feel free if you want to ask your questions and, and open your mic, uh, feel free to. Uh, thank you for the chance for, for letting me speak a little bit uh, on the topics. I'm really happy to be here and uh, listening to your uh, voice and uh, opinion regarding AI. I'm uh, personally working in this area and I've been working in safety and also currently on machine learning. Uh, I've, uh, I would like to discuss with you on some of the following opinion. One, um, we have now um, ethical uh, consideration of AI and we also have um, technologies to prepare uh, data, let, like uh, Martin has mentioned, to clean the data and to uh, make sure to, to remove kind of a bias and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I know, um, based on my uh, primitive knowledge on it, uh, for example, the differential privacy or um, any kind of uh, anonymity technologies. So is there any uh, further consideration or any current state of art, because I'm not actively looking in that area, that are currently introduced in UK or in uh, yeah in, in your area where you are working with um, to prevent kind of uh, ethical issues for the data. For example, I have just heard about this. Um, uh, Peter has mentioned the surveillance problem in China, for example, that people use the facial recognition data and so on. So how to protect facial data, for example, right? I know that we can use, for example, homomorphic encryption to protect those data when we are handling it over the cloud, over the internet, but um, also we also have this anonymization method to kind of remove the personalized data to be conformed, for example, to GDPR and to the new uh, law introduced in artificial intelligence. But, um, I'm not aware of any further uh, technologies besides just, let's say, removing kind of uh, personal data or zoidomizing data, replacing, let's say, new human names with ABC, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, we're not really interested in any individual. We're interested in more uh, soidotype 
the stereotype of people to find the statistical meaning out of the data. So this is what the, the machine needs. That's why we don't really need the personal data. So yeah, that's all from my side. I would like to hear from your side. Okay, are you maybe can you share uh, your uh, real life experience or real project experience how people are currently doing with the job? Um, I can I can try. I can share my uh, my knowledge and my opinion. Um, so I don't think there is a a perfect technology for trying to improve privacy and ethics linked to AI and data science. And part of that is because, so it's quite multifaceted. So some of it is because there's so many different models at the moment, which tend to be specialized in different areas. Um, and some of it is because some of it comes down to the intent of the person using the technology. So if we're talking about things like the uh, encryption that you mentioned, that's very useful for preventing um, or increasing privacy from the training data so that people feel more willing to allow their data to be used for training machine learning models, but, but it doesn't really do anything to prevent models from um, being used in an unethical way once, once they're created using that training data. Um, so even if, for example, um, everyone in the UK was happy because it was anonymized to allow their faces to be used for training facial recognition models, just because that's one that's come up. Uh, if those facial recognition models are then used to identify particular people who are involved in a particular scenario, um, that's still an unethical use of it, despite the fact that the privacy was preserved from that original training data. Um, and then other issues around things like um, the way that different models can be used means that different techniques are going to be applicable to different models. Personally, I don't think there is going to be a perfect technological answer ever really to making AI ethical. Uh, I think it actually comes down to more of a societal um, problem that we're going to have to solve alongside all of the other huge multitude of societal problems that we have. Um, but hopefully the opportunities will outweigh the, the problems. Oh, thank you for your opinion. Thank you. Um, we also have some questions from Alistair. Uh, same thing, Alistair, if you would like to pose them um, via audio, feel free to. Um, otherwise, I can read them. But yeah, okay, there are more comments, uh, but yeah. If not, that's fine. We also have questions from Roger. Uh, feel free, Roger, if you want to also voice your questions. Uh, oh. Sorry, I, yeah, I did yeah, ask sorry. my question earlier. Apologies, and apologies. It's, it's okay, the second question was about the recording and you've answered that as well. Yeah, just, just realized that, thank you. Um, there's another question from Diana. Um, same Diana, if you want to voice, otherwise I can read your question. Uh, in Alistair's case, it's more a comment with Dr. Tilo. Um, in Diana's case, the question is, should there always be an audit trail so we can find how an AI system came to any decision? Uh, yes, I was saying, should it actually be a legal requirement for any AI system to have an audit trail built in um, as an integral part of the system so that you can actually trace back how it came to a dec decision? Um, so there's, there's a couple of different aspects to that, I guess. Mm. Um, so it sounds like a good idea on the surface. The problem is that some of the most advanced AI systems that we have that give the best answers are essentially black boxes at the moment. You feed data in and you get a decision out at the other end. Because of the complexity of these models, um, you're talking uh, possibly billions of different parameters which are being tweaked within the model, uh, getting a definitive answer of it came out with this answer because X, Y, Z yeah. is really it's certainly not easy. It's an active field of research at the moment. Mm. Um, people are keen to get there 
I mean, if I suspect that it may be too difficult with some models, but if it is possible and they get there, then definitely an audit trail would be a good thing to have in place um, in some use cases. Mm. Uh, but at the moment, it's not technically feasible for some of the best models. For some of the more uh, simple models, um, kind of the more old fashioned models, decision trees, and random forests and things like that, you can actually do an analysis of how the system came to its decision. But uh, the downside for those is that they're generally not as effective as the complex models, which it's very hard to do the same with. Thank you. No Thank you very much, Diana. And I'm doing my best to keep up with chat and hands um, at the same time. Uh, we have another question from Kat. I can see your hand up, Tanya. Um, but I just would like to finish the last question in the chat, then go to Sophia and then Tanya. But there is uh, one from Kat. Uh, same thing, Kat, if you would like to uh, ask uh, with audio, that's great. If not, I'm happy to read it. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm just going to read from the chat. It's actually a comment, but um, uh, races regarding races in facial recognition, there's also the idea that if an algorithm or model only serves uh, a subset of people rather than all people, then it's exclusive, which can be harmful. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a fair comment. I don't really have much to add to it. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Well, um, now I will go back to Sophia. I, I saw you uh, raising your hand, Sophia. Then after Sophia, Tanya, then we can, you know, go with hands up um, from that point onwards, which probably is easier. Uh, Sophia, please. Hi, thank you. Um, so I was just wondering um, what the law actually is on data ethics and um, in particular with the facial recognition. And um, I guess just considering how things have been over the last two years and how we've seen um, different different things pan out in different ways and like, particularly like working from home more and we've seen the benefit to using technology more. And um, but with the facial recognition, I, I feel like it's something that's very, very personal because it's, you know, it's your face. And I, I wondered what the laws was on that and particularly around like kind of the general use. Like, do you think we will ever become a state like China, for example, where we are heavily monitored? Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to preface it by saying I'm definitely not a lawyer. So I don't really make it <laughs> practice to, to follow the laws in that much detail. Uh, we have um, within this country, we have some new laws which are coming in on data science. And we also have the, the UK GDPR. Um, those are some of the main laws around data science. And they kind of link into to data ethics to some extent. Um, certainly GDPR has a lot around uh, making sure that you're using people's data in ways that they are aware of and that you have informed consent to use their data in that way. Um, and so that kind of thing is, is good. It's a step in the right direction. Um, it's a difficult one, I think, because the, the, the trick with coming up with laws around that kind of thing is not stunting research so that you don't end up behind other powers in the world who perhaps don't have the same laws in place, but at the same time trying to make sure that uh, your researchers are behaving in an, in an ethical manner. So it's always going to be quite tricky. We also have um, the, the top link in my further resources here is the, the data ethics framework, which is for public institutions in the UK. Um, and that's quite a useful, I kind of do a session with my students where I walk them through it uh, in some detail, um, but that's quite a useful way to think about behaving ethically in data science. Um, so that's worth looking at. And somewhat I can see someone's put a link in the chat as well on possibly some more uh, EU laws around AI. So that might be worth looking at too. Um, yeah, because I, I was considering it as well, I guess where we've left the EU and um, where they were looking at amending some of um, the human rights. And um, I wondered how that would um, impact people. And there was also um, something I noticed recently um, in some of the supermarkets. Um, as you walk into many of the supermarkets now, a lot of them have um, screens that are showing that you're being recorded. But um, more recently, I've noticed that as you walk in, the screens are showing either a circle or a square around your face as you walk in. So 
Um, I guess that's why I was asking the question. You know, uh, I wonder if uh, the, the current laws that we have in place, mm. is that enough to um, safeguard people's privacy? And to which extent are, can companies um, or, or government use it? And I guess for, for, for that example, for example, in, in somewhere in a supermarket, um, where I guess they may want to use it for something like um, the prevention of, of theft, for example. So if there were no shoplifters, of, for example, coming in, then they would be um, alerted of that, for example, and yeah. um, maybe that would be a benefit to it. But then I think there really is also the kind of downside to that is, you know, why would they want to hold like so much information on someone to, to that kind of level? and um, yeah, there, there was one yeah. thing I read about um, the police, actually. Um, there was a police van that was taking um, facial recognition pictures sorry, of, of people um, that were walking by in the street. And so I'm not sure if this was a one-off or whether it was just something they were trialling or whether it's perhaps something that's more common because I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also wondering, is it something that, you know, could be in plain sight you know we are interacting with it day to day and it's gathering data and we don't actually know or mm. do the companies do we have to be told you know I would you say the current laws are sufficient I, sorry I think it's really long the, <laughs> that's all right I, i'm just trying to pick it apart a little bit I, I think the concerns that you have there um there's there's a whole bunch of kind of different privacy concerns and, and for the most part i'd be um largely on board with you i, I tend to be more on the privacy individual rights side of things personally than uh the other side if you like um but it's it's certainly a personal aspect different people fall in different places along that spectrum um in terms of the supermarkets i could be wrong i'm going to preface by saying that but i believe that rather than using facial recognition at the moment what they're doing is just using fairly simple algorithms that can identify faces within the images so that they can make sure that they focus in uh, and record the right things um, if anyone's aware of that not being correct feel free to, to mention it in a minute but otherwise i think that's the case um Thank you. More gen, yeah, more generally, I think it, it's definitely a concern moving forwards. I think the trend at the moment, in the UK at least, is for uh, less privacy and individual rights. Um, that seems to be the way that it's going, but I possibly wouldn't think that's that's the best way for it to be going. No, <laughs> without without wanting that. to be drawn into a political <laughs> debate, but yeah. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, I think I just wondered what um, what the laws currently, you know, what protection does that give us as individuals, and um, like generally, um, yeah, how how does that reflect in in different scenarios? Um, given facial recognition, because even if you think with your phone, um, another thing um, that I noticed is more and more companies and facilities are asking us to log in with our face, and so, for example, on banking. Um, I mean, banking is a particular one um, that they are encouraging people to use an app and log in using Face ID. But I also noticed it with um, emails and, and generally more places are kind of um, adopting the, the use of the facial recognition um, in preference for like passwords. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of that takes place on device for privacy reasons um but how much of that will continue is questionable um, i mean there's always the problem is there's always good good excuses or good reasons depending on which side of the the thing you fall on for uh not not having privacy if you see what i mean so there was the recent thing with um with iphones where they were planning to use machine learning to scan images in people's uh, iCloud accounts to try to identify images which were um, essentially child abuse type images, which I'm sure everyone completely agrees is not a terrible thing to be doing. But at the same time, if it's not confined to that, then it could be a problem. And, and that was where some of the concerns came in, because people made the point, well, OK, if you can use it to identify that and if you are drawing your images to identify from 
government bodies, for example, what's to stop those government bodies from saying, okay, we want you to find people who are doing this because it's something terrible, and it turns out to be political dissent of some kind. Um, so it, it, it is a broad and difficult issue. Most of the, so the two major smartphone manufacturers I know uh, are trying to do more things on device so that they can market themselves as being more privacy oriented. Of course, they're also selling all your advertising data at the same time. So how true they are about that is questionable. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really complex area. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, we can probably move to Tanya and then Roger and then uh, Dr. T. Lu, uh, following the, the hands. Uh, Tanya, please. Uh, I was thinking about issues of credibility and accountability. So like what would be a, any examples of what's a good division of labor between AI and human intervention and any interesting issues that come up from that, how you design tasks for when people work together with, as we use algorithms. Yeah, I think it, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm not, I'm not a huge or total Elon Musk fan, but I know that he has had some thoughts along the kind of lines of combining humans with AI. Um, so cuts his uh, Neuralink company, part of the intention of that is to improve the interface between human minds and computers with the idea that moving forwards humans and AI could work together. That's kind of a far future version of the same thing but working with AI more today um, I think you it's it's a it's a tricky one to answer because generally speaking automation is going to improve things um, if it achieves the same kind of effects that you want as you were getting from the humans in the first place. Um, people working together with AI is kind of happening all over the place, I suppose. Um, but generally speaking, it's a case of all of the more routine jobs tending to be taken over by AI systems uh, and then people working alongside them in a supervisorial role. So I'm thinking of places like um, car manufacturing factories, for example, which are almost all roboticized nowadays. And you have just a few people um, who are kind of essentially supervising the robots in a sense and making sure that everything's working as it should be. Um, I don't know if that's the right balance. Um, moving forwards, I, I, I can certainly see, probably not anytime too soon, but I can certainly see a potential future where either the kinds of jobs that people are doing would have to change quite a lot to keep society going in the way that it is, or the number of people working could end up reducing. Uh, and that's the argument for some of the other aspects that have been talked about in the news, like universal basic incomes and things like that. Um, one of the arguments for that kind of thing is that we could reach a point in the future where actually it's not really necessary or perhaps even desirable for everyone to be working, but we presumably still don't want people to be starving. So we need some system for preventing that. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I, I had a stab. <laughs> Thank you very much, Will. Uh, we could probably go with Roger now. Yes, thank you. This is really a comment rather than a question. I mean, I think that Sophia is right to be concerned about the privacy in the way that she described. But I sort of, uh, I think also in terms of things like genetic engineering, and I think that uh, it's all very well. We don't need to be too concerned. We live in a reasonably properly managed ethical democracy, a liberal democracy. I'm rather concerned about possible futures where there are malicious individuals in rogue states and you can't trust everybody all the time. And I think that's the thing that we need to be worried about. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree. Certainly, I mean, there's been, there was a kind of um, a short thing on um, YouTube about drone swarms. And then there's been some stuff around the same kind of thing that's a bit more realistic that's been coming up recently. So this is the idea that you could have drones which can um, target either individual people or groups of people, and you could send them into, for example, cities to do very um, surgical strikes, to use rather a distasteful kind of term. Um, yeah, those kind of uses for AI are certainly, 
I mean, probably to some extent, the genie is out of the um, out of the uh, whatever they're in. I can't think, but you know what I mean. I, th I think to some extent that is kind of happening. If we can prevent that as much as possible, then that would be probably ideal. Um, but there are going to be issues uh, moving forwards with AI because everything's kind of already happening and the progress is so fast. So to my mind, in some ways, it's almost as much there's almost as much danger around the future uses of it as there would be around uh, nuclear, just in a slightly different way. Brilliant. Um, so we can now go with the uh, last question, I'm afraid, guys. Uh, I'm sure you're all very excited with the area. Um, we'll, you can probably share your contact details in, in the chat. And uh, I'm going to open the uh, opportunity for Dr. T. Lu to ask uh, the last question. And unfortunately, we'll have to finish after that because of the time. Uh, yes, uh, feel free, Dr. Uh, T. Lu. Thank you for the last chance. Uh, I'd like to just uh, be in contact uh, with the speaker. Uh, it would be great to, to be uh, connected um, later because uh, this uh, discussion and uh, the topic is quite interesting and I would like to be connected with all you guys. That's basically what, what I want to ask. And um, I've also posted my question in the chat regarding quantum computing, how that impact uh, the undeterministic uh, issue with AI because my opinion was uh, AI is anyway uh, not dangerous <laughs> in the sense that we can basically exhaustive, exhaustively uh, model checking all the possible trails of uh, AI because it is a computing system and computing system is verifiable and I've been working on the safety in, 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 in the area and uh, that was my PhD topic of verifying <laughs> protocol uh, of safety of the protocol. So uh, if uh, I can basically know whatever a system will do, uh, then I can predict it and it is deterministic and I'm fine. But now with uh, quantum computing, I'm uh, doubting myself because uh, the qubit uh, kind of uh, quite, quite fancy and non-deterministic. I'm not sure if I can control that. So that might introduce a new challenge. So this is a kind of a quite interesting topic that I would like to continue with you maybe offline as uh, I think it will be too, too big topic, unless you, if you directly have some uh, answer to um, me. I, 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 can, I can respond a little bit and then I've popped my email in the chat. So if you want to carry yeah. on offline as well, that, that's fine. Um, yeah, so, so just to respond a little bit, I think, so in terms of deterministicness, if that's a word, um, it's quite difficult to anticipate, even with current models, all of the possible um, positions within a search space um, that a kind of learning algorithm might move a machine learning model through. Um, I haven't seen your research. If you link me to it, I'll have a look. But it's certainly it, that's a challenge even at the moment. So moving forwards into much more non-deterministic areas like quantum computing, um, it's certainly there's the scope for computers to be more unpredictable than they already are, which, as you're kind of saying, will make them harder to predict what is happening. Um, certainly quantum computing is something I don't have a huge amount of knowledge on. If I had about uh, I don't know, 10 more hours in the day, it's something I'd spend some time learning. Um, perhaps I'll manage to find some time at some point. But certainly, I think it's going to have a big impact on optimization um, and therefore on AI as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we are, we are more or less the same opinion, but uh, yeah. still, there's a lot to explore. Definitely an interesting topic. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you very much, everyone. It was a really, really good and engaging webinar. We had a very good number of participants, and, and that's a, that was a very good and engaging talk, Will. Um, I have posted a link where uh, the recording will be made available in a couple of days. Um, I'm sure everyone understands it takes a while to re upload the recording, but in a couple of days, it will be available on the link I put in the chat. Will has also 
uh, posted his email address, so feel free to contact Will uh, whenever, and uh, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to interact with everyone on that. The next webinar will be on the 5th of October, same time on health technologies, and we're going to be having Dr. Mark Bailey from the NHS. It will be also very, very interesting, and I hope you all have enjoyed, and I wish you all a very good evening to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.